Right, last couple of moments. You ever so slightly ahead of us. We're, we're, the chair gives it away. We're missing one panel member, um, so we'll be with you in a moment. Ah, we're in business. Lorenzo, welcome. Um, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so this session is a chance to drill down again a little further. So the ambition, having started big, we're starting to sort of try and head ever closer towards action and what how do we what can you take away and what's going to help and we've assembled a fabulous panel who in a moment are going to get a chance to introduce themselves and bring to life a little bit about what they're doing um and that then we'll be back over to you so there will two microphones down here we'll find their way around the room and we'll open up for q a and a chance to for you to interrogate this group of folk to hopefully help you take those next steps that we're going to look at doing so sh without further ado if i could turn First to James, um, please grab those microphones, share them, share them about. James, you want to introduce yourself and a little bit about what it is you do. Sure. Um, I'm actually a bit of an oddity here. So my farm's not in the National Park. Uh, it's down on the coast between Littlehampton and Bognor Regis. And I guess the reason why I've started working with the National Park is nature doesn't respect boundaries uh, in any way, shape or form. And uh, I'm a, a very, very... I call myself a hard-nosed uh, arable farmer. Father's generation was tasked with uh, ending uh, food uh, rationing, you know, and there were food security issues. And I think as we go forwards, our generation now is looking towards decarbonizing and looking at uh, restoring, uh, or, uh, whether we're not, whether we're restoring nature or preventing any more losses, um, it's certainly on our radar. I'm also chairman of the Chichester Crop Consultancy, an agronomy group, uh, that employs six agronomists and we give advice from Dorset to Kent. So I've got a reasonable idea of, of what's going on in the arable farming uh, business and, and how it is impacting nature from my own personal experiences. So let's call it the Atomer effect. You know, I had that sort of moment where I thought, crikey, things aren't that good. You know, the insecticides that we're using and whatever, surely there must be another way. So I peered across the chasm uh, and away at the far side of this chasm there's Charlie Burrell from from Nep Castle Estate looking at me and uh, the two of us got together we're from different worlds I mean completely different worlds but actually we realized that there were a lot of synergies between us um, despite the, the, the obvious uh, differences and so Charlie and I got together and we, th we, th we started to look at uh, nature restoration at scale across the, the county of uh, well, counties of East and West Sussex. So that's where the Wheel to Waves uh, ambition was born. And I call it an ambition because it's exactly that. We just put some lines on a map. They followed the river valleys. These are the more marginal land. So we weren't looking at giving people binary choices where, you know, where the, it's, it's either food or nature on the land. We, we looked at these uh, uh, river valleys because th uh, that then gave the opportunity for nature to thrive and for the farming systems to thrive as well. And the other thing uh, that is really important to remember, and we haven't heard a lot of about it today, but this is, farmers can obviously offer a lot to the solution of this problem, this nature crisis, but it's not only farming that's caused this problem. And through the Wheel to Waves um, initiative, we've mapped the problems. We've mapped light pollution, noise pollution, uh, sewage pollution. And so when we look at the effects of, of, of the towns, cityscapes, Gatwick Airport, Southern Water, we realize that the assault on nature is not just from agriculture. Uh, and that's really important to remember. So uh, I'll just hand the mic over. But uh, so the other thing I, I do want to say is that as farmers, we do recognize that the past practices are not sustainable. We can see our soils have been degraded. Farmers are wanting to do the right thing. We also realize that not all nature is friendly for farming. Lots of aphids and things carry viruses. And so you know, the need to use insecticides goes on. We, don't, we can't shy away from these problems. <laughs> Uh, but we genuinely want to do uh, better by nature. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Colin. Thank you. Uh, Colin Smart. I'm on the board of directors for the Environmental Farmers Group. Uh, it's a farming cooperative that's operating in the natural capital trading sector. 
Uh, we're just about to celebrate our second birthday as being a uh, limited company by guarantee. We're not for profit. Uh, today we've got 438 members covering about 230,000 hectares. We started off life down in the uh, Hampshire Avon area. It was built very much on the back of the farm cluster movement, which is now over a decade old. The architect of those clusters was Theresa Dent from the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. Um, and three years ago, we started to get together with the chairs of those cluster groups to say, what's going to happen to the fantastic philanthropic uh, environmental work that they've been carrying out over the last decade um, uh, as, as we see uh, BPS tapering off? Uh, and we all know that when farming is under financial pressure, sadly, the first thing that normally has to go is the good environmental uh, outcomes on the farm. So from those scoping groups, we formed this, uh, this farmers' cooperative. And I think we thought initially that it would stay in the Hampshire Avon catchment, 177,000 hectares. Um, and our aims, really, is for biodiversity recovery, species recovery, clean water in our wonderful chalk streams, particularly in that part of the world, and to help our members get to carbon net zero by 2040, the NFU target. Um, but as we started to uh, gather momentum, it was very obvious that there were other catchments uh, that were interested. So the Testanichian, very famous chalk streams, the Dorset Stour, and, and very importantly, the Paul Harbour catchment, farmers from those areas started to make inquiries, could they join this cooperative? Uh, and actually, Helen Avery and Lord Benyon uh, had been great supporters from the very beginning. And so we went to them and said, you know, we didn't really think we were going to expand, but what should we do? Uh, and expand we have. And as I say, today we're 100, uh, sorry, uh, 438 uh, members. We're from more or less from the X in Devon, uh, right across uh, to the Hampshire border up to the M4. We've got a large group now in the Midlands and another large group in uh, North Lincolnshire, all with the same aims. That is to farm profitably, produce food, but to do it in a very environmental way. And that's where we use the science from the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust to help us, help our members to make this move. So we're trading in the regulated markets at the moment, in the BNG and nutrient neutrality markets, and we've, we've completed some trades in that area. But we too see the bigger goal uh, in the voluntary markets, and we're just starting some dialogue now with two corporates to work together in partnership to see if we can find uh, things that we can do for them in these investable landscapes. And we're looking at catchment scale landscapes, which, you know, we all, today we've heard, you know, scale is absolutely everything in nature. It doesn't. Uh, uh, look at boundaries, it, 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 the bigger the scale, the better the outcome. And that really, I've not met a farmer yet in our group that they want to leave it better than they found it. And I think that's a really positive thing to take forward. Thank Thanks you. ever so much, Colin. And Debbie. <coughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Debbie Tan. I'm the chief executive of Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. So one of the, one of the wildlife trusts, there's 46 of us all over the UK. Um, we're a charity that's, um, well, nationally we're over 100 years old, so we've been doing this a long time, nature conservation. And we're about, I don't know, 200 million uh, income nationally. We've really, really grown in the last few years, and certainly we are, you know, really at the vanguard of trying to demonstrate what delivery of nature-based solutions looks like, um, because it's a really amazing opportunity. Um, you know, if you've been in nature conservation a long time, you'll remember things like biodiversity action plans and all of these kind of visions and things that we've had for decades. We didn't really have very many mechanisms to deliver innovative landscape scale restoration, but we have now, and it's really brilliant and really exciting to kind of show how to, how to do it well. Um, my main experience is in the nutrient neutrality market. Um, I think we delivered the first scheme in England in the solar catchment, and certainly we were involved with Natural England in pretty much inventing, uh, piloting and inventing the nutrient credit scheme and figuring out how it might work in the Solent. And we took a really massive risk. Um, we borrowed lots of money, we bought some land, we leased some land, um, and we've been delivering nutrient credits in the Solent now for the last four years. We've been able to restore, um, so far we've restored, how much is it? About 450 acres or so of land we've already done. 
And we're now trialling lots of different methods, which is kind of interesting. So the first uh, scheme, we bought the land and sold the credits ourselves. The second farm, we, we worked with a farmer in partnerships, a sort of joint venture, and half the estate is rewilding and half the estate is farming, regenerative farming. So that's a really nice partnership. Um, and then the third model, we're working with some kind of natural capital investors to bring some other land forward, and that'll be another 550 acres. Um, so we've got three different models, all of which are delivering incredible results for biodiversity in strategic locations, and all of which are very much either next door or in partnership with regenerative farming. Um, and just one quick point on everybody talks about nutrient neutrality. That's not enough, is it? You know, just to offset impact isn't enough. We've always delivered nutrient reduction, so we actually deliver over and above the, the, the offsetting, so we're delivering additional benefits. And it's really, um, you know, very limiting because at the moment it only applies to habitat sites, you know, SACs, SBAs, etc. But if you think about the quality, the state of our rivers, not a single river in England is in good condition, then really we want to see schemes like this rolled out everywhere. So one of our I guess policy asks is to try and uh, demonstrate that these schemes can work, we can stack them with BNG as well, and actually once you get going, it's actually fairly straightforward to demonstrate those benefits. We are monitoring everything so we can show government that it works, soils, nutrient levels, and of course biodiversity. And we're publishing all of those results as well, because um, it's really important that you show, show what, what, how it works and how to do it. So I'll leave it there, happy to answer any questions. Fair. And Lorenzo. Hi there, everybody. Thank you very much for a wonderful session today. Um, so I'm Lorenzo Cucci, the co-founder of Earthly. So Earthly was set up really to help businesses invest and support nature-based solutions. I think right from the beginning when we looked at the markets, there was a lack of trust. There was, you know, failure, as we saw last year, over crediting risks. Um, but fundamentally, a system that, you know, could, could help, but could help more than just carbon, could help on biodiversity, could help, help on social factors. So, Earthly, you know, was built uh, and, and has, has created a system of scoring projects, really based on a holistic view. So, not only the carbon, but the social impact and biodiversity impact. And that's really important for us. And, and so, um, that's been a key, a key tool for us to help us source leading projects from around the world. And, and biodiversity has always been at the core of what we do. And so when we were given the opportunity and then saw, you know, the, op you know, the, the, the opportunity to help the UK in its, go in its goals to achieve 30 by, th you know, by 2030 and to work with Mark and Ben, I think this, this was a really important thing for us. And, and to, to take all the things that we've heard about how to scale and, and, and grow in a market with integrity has been really essential. So enabling, you know, buyers to, to source and and to get involved in UK restoration was, was really critical. But to make sure that that's done in a, in a method that you know, doesn't cause greenwashing or, or even green hushing. I think today we've heard about greenwashing, but, but there's, we need to get more people to support nature. We need to find that, that market, that private market. And we need people to believe that nature can do so much. You know, we've, we've heard it all, you know, from, from nutrients to, 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 to social impact, um, carbon, biodiversity. So it's, it's really fundamental to, to show the impact that nature can have and to, and to have those private companies be proud of that work. Um, and so we, we also try to make sure that, that that is something that we can deliver and communicating the right way. Um, um, so we're really, we're really proud to be working um, on this project and to helping the, you know, South Downs and Bed. Um, and you know, we're excited to to bring the corporate world to these projects. We have over 700 customers that that really want to support nature. Um, we were proud to have won the global RFP to become Deloitte's um, primary nature solutions partner. So, you know, we see that the the, the private you know companies out there do want to do good. Um, there is net zero ambitions. You know, nature fundamentally is, is what's coming next. We really need uh, the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures to, 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 start, to start to really build. Um, and I think when we see that uh, and we can demonstrate um, the positive of nature, we'll see much more coming to the market, much more money flowing in. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Lorenzo. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much to the invite, Mark, to, to be here. I'm Mike Sander. I'm from Habitat Vault. Um, my background uh, primarily was uh, private contracting. Uh, essentially, we were working for the likes of National Grid, Thames Water, uh, the Environment Agency to 
uh, assist and help them manage their, their land across the, the UK. And uh, myself and, uh, and, and my, my business partner sort of saw the Environment Act coming into play and seeing this opportunity where nature is actually going to get um, seen as a more positive uh, aspect to something to invest in. Having, coming from the contracting side of things, generally it was always, can it be cheap? Quality is not really on the agenda. Get it done, get it done quickly. So it's nice to be on the other side of the coin, to be helping uh, essentially landowners uh, navigate the sphere of, of B&G, getting um, some sites signed up to, to create this habitat in, uh, in the UK. And we've currently got 12 uh, sites that are going through that process at the moment across uh, England. Um, and essentially our team of ecologists, I'm the, the, the chief operating officer, I'm not an ecologist, so I work with a good team of uh, professionals to help guide um, different landowners through that process. So essentially what we're trying to do in terms of, and we're hearing it time and time again today, is it's about this gold standard, it's really, really important to us. If we can help standardise certain um, processes, we can then help achieve uh, this across a wider uh, area, much, much quicker. Um, and essentially help uh, bring this along much for, uh, quicker for, for, for landowners. So uh, we're essentially, my, my other part of the background is, is utilising technology as well within this sphere. I think that's really, really important uh, to help, uh, you know, local planning authorities we're seeing at the moment in terms of their, their uh, resources can be quite you know, strained at times and this is a new piece of legislation that's coming and thrown in and helping you know, them to actually deliver this and monitor this in the future. We see that uh, things like remote sensing is, is, is an important tool to help manage that in the long term um, and help point us in directions to, to where we need to be looking to, to achieve and see and monitor and actually give this some tangibility, measurable, um, precise, you know, precision monitoring is, is really, really important to us. So it's something that we'll be bringing into our schemes as well. So that's me, happy to answer any questions you may have. <laughs> <laughs> That's the plan in a minute. Plenty of questions to come. Mark, uh, do you want to jump in? Thank you. Oh, is that working? Perfect. Um, yes, so my name's Mark Alden. I'm the Nature Based Solutions Manager here at the South Downs National Park Authority. Um, I was sort of just listening to, to those amazing bios and I was thinking it's amazing to share this stage and this room with inspirational leaders in this field and architects of nature's recovery. Um, but I probably have to confess, uh, confess I'm not in either of those, I'm, I'm probably the, the boring process person uh, in this. And, and, but I love that role, actually. Um, we at the, the South Downs um, are taking a leading role in nature-based solutions. And it's a privilege to be supporting landowners and land managers on their uh, aspirations um, around nature's recovery, climate action. Um, and I'm a cog in the machine um, of the authority and we are blessed with great people to, to enable boring process people like me to have fun in, in the areas that I um, can specialise in. And, uh, and fundamentally, um, we are here for supporting those landowners, as Nick alluded to earlier, facilitating, adding value, and enabling um, landowners, land managers, stakeholders to deliver um, our national park purposes. So thank you. Thanks, Mark. And don't underplay. I think... Um, Cogs are hugely important, but and then in this case, we are driving towards action. And uh, take note of that face. Take, this is if you want to get in touch with the authority, if you want to pick these think, conversations up, if you want to do something, then Mark is definitely your man. So I needed to do that a little pitch for you there. Um, so we've got, if I can turn to colleagues, there's a couple of microphones down here if they're ready to get circulated. It's over to you, everybody. This is a chance. We've, we are seeking to enlist you to become pioneers with us. We've assembled a wonderful group of pioneers who are getting out there and being active in a host of different ways. And so this is your chance to ask some of those quest the questions that might help you take that next step. And thank you ever so much. Uh, I need a gavel, don't I? Sort of, you want, you've won. Uh, but do you want to kick us off, please? And if I could encourage you to say who you are and where you're from first, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, Doug McNabb from Land Use Consultants. Um, if I could ask Debbie a, a question to kick off. Um, Debbie, I know you've been doing fantastic work down in, in South Hampshire with the, with the nutrient mitigation projects. Um, and I was wondering if you could say a bit more about maybe some of the key lessons learned uh, from that really pioneering experience. And maybe also say a bit about perhaps where you're heading and if you're looking at other sorts of uh, selling other sorts of benefits, perhaps beyond 
future util neutrality? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, so I think because we were pretty much, well, I think we were the first project in the Solent, so we kind of had to invent everything. You know, how do you, how do, you do it? And, you know, in the nature market principles we talked about earlier, always right at the heart, so very transparent, um, making sure you're delivering over and above, so the additionality point really key, working with communities, all of that. But the paperwork side of things, I needed one of you, <laughs> Um, was pretty painful, so we had to uh, basically invent a sort of hybrid Section 106, Section 33 agreement because actually what we're doing is providing mitigation not in the same place as where the planning, the development is happening. So you've immediately got the A, political issues, um, but B, just the, the sort of practical and legal issues about how you make sure that the compliance monitoring is correct. So you've got one local authority kind of monitoring on behalf of another. Um, and just the time, I would say, I mean, it's much quicker now because obviously we've done a lot of that learning and we did, we did the pain on behalf of everybody else. So a lot of the paperwork that we pioneered is now being rolled out. And, you know, you'll know now that Natural England have rolled this out across about 38 authorities. But I think, you know, if I can wrap it up in a nutshell, I think you've got to have excellent partnerships and trust. You need the local planning authorities maybe more than one, sometimes three, Natural England, probably the Environment Agency, and you kind of need the buy-in of the community as well because you're looking at land use change. So the nutrient reduction model is a bit different to the BNG model because actually all you're doing is removing the nutrient pollution. So there's not really a set kind of biodiversity creation that you're doing, so we're actually doing rewilding. We're sort of working with nature to see what nature wants to do, re-wetting, bringing in grazing animals and stuff. But a bit like NEP, you know, we had the ragwort issue and the thistles and all of those things that, you know, many people don't like. So we've done loads and loads of work with the community to really demonstrate what we're doing. Lots of biodiversity monitoring and showing, you know, the fantastic wildlife that's coming in and turning up. But we've been very sympathetic and... Uh, and considerate, I think, to our neighbours as well and making sure that we're communicating really, really well and involving the public. But So, you know, you need a lot of time, a lot of patience, good communication skills and lots of monitoring because, you know, you've got to show that it works, haven't we? So you've got to measure that nutrient reduction, you've got to look at water quality, soil health and biodiversity. So we're doing all of that. So, you know, the first scheme, we didn't really make any much money because we invested hugely in all of that infrastructure around it. The second scheme, we've made more money because we'd already done the groundwork. Um, and yes, we are looking at other schemes because our mission as a wildlife trust is to deliver nature recovery. And if you think about 30 by 30 and you do the maths, just in Hampshire and Isle of Wight alone, I reckon we need about 50 to 60,000 hectares of land to get to 30%. So I don't know what it is in Sussex, but it's a lot. You know, we've only got six years. So we need to hurry up. Thanks, Debbie. Um, you mentioned NEP. I wondered, James, if there's any a similar question about any immediate lessons learned from that process you just uh, as you got started and kicked off. Sorry, I'll just <laughs> take the opportunity whilst I look for the next question as well. Uh, well, I'm not NEP. I generally try to distance myself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, you mentioned, I think you mentioned it in passing, looking over the bridge. Partnership with NEP, Partnership, yeah, sure. Yes, indeed. Sorry, that's yeah, what I was meaning, yeah. yeah um, so, no, I really can't comment on their behalf. Well, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, I drove down a cul-de-sac there, sadly, but f forgive me all. Uh, however, what it did do is yield a couple more questions in the audience. Uh, if we could take the lady at the front first, and then we'll come across, and then we'll head back. Right, we've got a journey. We've got a rack of questions. Please dive Thank in. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm a, a, um, a farmer in the South Downs and also a member of the National Park. Um, we're, we're talking about what is an emerging market in every sense, and, and for me, the big barrier to access is the upfront finance that any of these schemes need. And uh, in the Downs, we haven't had a huge success with a sort of landscape scale delivery, as yet I'm sure it will come. But do the, any of the panel have confidence that the buyers will be there, that ESG will become something so that there's a green balance sheet as well as a financial balance sheet for a corporate Thanks so much. Lorenzo, do you want to kick us off? Um, I mean, I think what we've seen is that you know, 
customers are voting with their wallets. We, we know we've, we've, we've seen that, you know, that people are paying attention. I think there was a great timeline of, of that change, uh, you know, that happened through the years. You know, we've seen that, I think, you know, fundamentally businesses trying to uh, appeal to those buyers, making better choices with the, the, you know, the supply chains that they're using closer to home, different, you know, organic cottons and things like that. So that's definitely the part of it. And I think that then feeds through to the shareholders as well now, where they, they require, you know, they want more to see more from their businesses as well. So the, the, the pressure is mounting up on these companies to, to not only achieve net zero, but to continue to find, you know, a connection with customers and their stakeholders that, that has an ultimate value. You know, shareholders know that there's a long-term benefit to being, you know, understanding the impact to nature and how you, their, you know, their inputs are being found and sourced. So I think fundamentally there's a, a big macro driver. Um, and I think that's driving the, the, the market as well. Pe corporates do want to um, deliver on this promise. Um, they're looking for... Uh, ways of demonstrating the value. I think one of the things that is, is key is to, you know, how do they calculate their actual nature impact? I think that's the big new thing. And I, I think looking at TNFD, it, the, the LEAP process, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's quite complicated. I think that's going to be one of the big shifts is, is how do we get corporates to uh, assess the impact that they have on nature quickly so that then we can look at, right, how do we make those reductions within our supply chain, with our, uh, our, 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 our processes, but also in the meantime, like was discussed today, what can we do in the meantime to support nature? So I think that will be the big driver. I think we are still a nascent market, but you know, when it comes to, let's say, carbon, we, you know, we've seen businesses making huge uh, um, uh, you know, um, claims and, and already seeing it from, from the balance sheet. You know, from a fundamental risk of net zero, you had a, a, a chief financial officer that says net zero is here, but you, you don't know how to get there. You still have 10% residual emissions that you need, to, you, know, you need to offset, right? And so now those chief financial officers are saying, well, I need to know what that cost is. I need to know the risk. Uh, and so they're coming to the market. And, and I think that's going to continue to happen. People looking uh, at understanding how they can find value for their customers and, and their business. Because not doing it right has a reputational risk. And leaving it too late has a reputational risk. So yes, we're early. Um, but I think fundamentally the corporates are coming and they will continue to come faster. Thanks, Ranger. And I think I'd, I'd add other members, please dive in. Um, we'll go yeah, I, I think from our perspective in terms of how the market has, has developed, it, it, there was an initial sort of uh, hesitancy, I'd say, from, from developers coming forward to, to buy units. or um, That's certainly changing. I would say literally within the last couple of months, there's, there's definitely people that were just holding back a little bit. And now they realise this isn't, this isn't going to change. This is something that they need to embrace and uh, look for. So... I think uh, that combined with the voluntary market, um, I, I see that, you know, hand in hand will, will really sort of develop over the next, uh, yeah, 12 to 18 months, certainly on the developer side. Uh, I think it's certainly a little bit slower than, than we'd all hope, but um, there's so many factors and so many learning. Everybody's uh, sort of learning from a point of view of new pieces of legislation being implemented legal teams that haven't really come across this before and now they're asking for their input and of course we know what lawyers are like when they want their <laughs> sort of two pennies left to, to put on forward so all of these things that come time uh, as this develops as, as you know uh, landmark projects like the eye for the state have actually set helped pave the way for, for us to follow in in terms of those templates and a starting point things will generally start to smooth out i think in time to come I'll be a bit more yeah. negative, actually, if you don't mind. Um, you know, as a landowner, you, you want to know, don't you, that the buyers are there. And so we did, you know, we own land, we bought land, um, and we took out a loan, actually, which was horrendously risky. Had a few sleepless nights. Um, but I think what we did is we, we got, we really, really assessed demand first, and we did things like, um, you know, pre-sold credits. We also took deposits from people, we had waiting lists and various other things because, you know, so I would probably advise you if you are thinking of going to this market is, you know, just make sure you, you've got a bit of a pipeline of buyers and not just rely on the promises. And I think Ben mentioned, you know, you're not 100% sure that you, you're going to sell all of those credits. And I do slightly worry that we're going to oversupply or have oversupply at the beginning because there's huge interest 
and the, the buyers are quite slow to come forward. Um, but actually, if we can work together, and particularly I think on the planning side, it's easier because you can look at local plans and you can try and work out what the demand is. On the corporate and tier, tiered FD side, you know, there is really no assessment of what that looks like yet. Um, so I would, you know, perhaps if you are thinking about this, I'd try and get some numbers and some commitments and maybe pre-sell if you can, so at least some. We had to do that because we had a loan. We had to actually work to kind of show how we're going to pay it back, which helps concentrate the mind, if I could <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> Thanks, Debbie. I, I think there's a, another point in there. If you think of the, the big, big um, thresholds, I suppose, net zero by 2050 or 2045 if you're in Scotland, 30 by 30, they're fab you know, w we sign up to those, that's fabulous, but they're in the distance, and I suppose the closer we get to them, it's becoming a pressure pot something's going to have to change and it's when it changes it's going to have it's going to happen fairly quickly and so the challenge for us is we want this community you've you've opted in to join this community because you've you're, you're bringing with it some values and belief about the fundamental value of nature in your thoughts and thinking we want to be on the front foot so when that does tip the balance when a government policy shifts far enough to sort of unlock what, whatever the combination might become we're in the right place to respond because otherwise we could be on the back foot. And if, what you've, if you've learned anything so far today, there's a lot of homework <laughs> necessary to think about how to put these together. Forgive me for taking chair's privilege. Well, thank you ever so much for that question and, and panel. Um, we'll head across to the other side of the room. Thank you. There's oh, lost you in the mic. Is that, yeah, that's working better now. A bit of a connection to the last question. I put a private investor hat on. Assume I have money in my pocket, which I will do at the end of the year. Um, what's being done to communicate this type of investment to the IFA community so that I can go and say, I want to spend some of my money on this, um, how can I do it? And getting it into fund managers. Mark and I were talking about this briefly, and it's really about um, accessibility of this to the small investor. So without that, how are you going to get the money in out of the non-corporate market? So anybody I'm just looking at facial expressions this is the moment where you try to read the panel work out who's who's keenest to answer I, I'm going to uh, small investors I mean in a way I think that's uh, I'm looking to you Mark now to sort of whilst the rest of the panel get a chance to think um, if I understand correctly actually some of the renature some of the driver behind those things has very much been about thinking about the smaller investor perhaps not quite as far as general IFAs and general advice but can you give us a, a starter a thought I'll try I'll try so I think it all sort of depends which, which market that you're looking to invest in, if you like. And I think the compliance markets, um, whether that's nutrient neutrality or biodiversity net gain, the pathway is pretty simple. Um, when it comes to the voluntary um, markets, woodland carbon, certainly, voluntary biodiversity credits now. Um, the aspiration is, as, as Nick mentioned earlier, that, that we have a click-through system, and it could be as easy as... Was it ordering a bed on Amazon? I think, yeah. I mean, that's the dream. You know, it needs to be accessible. Um, but the reality is we're a little way away from that. But, of course, that click-through system needs to be underpinned by um, rigour, ethics, regulation, process. So no matter how the end user might see the simplicity of it, it needs to be underpinned by... Uh, someone called it a sort of iceberg effect. You know, you might see the simple button on the top of the water surface, but under it is a is in a sort of bus size um, network of complexity. Um, what that means, I think, in terms of your investment, Andrew, I'm not entirely sure if I'm l linking my answer to your question. I'm trying, but I'm definitely buying the, the panel a bit of time to think. So I might have done one role there, but <laughs> does that help in some way? Yeah, um, we're gonna pass the back to it. Mark, uh, sorry, uh, Mike, do you wanna pick up there? Uh, yeah, no, I've I sort of seen it in the same sense, I think, for sort of private investment, be more on the ability to have it as a optional extra to, to something. In, in terms of pushing it into a fund, I'm sure that's that's something that, that's gonna be a mark in itself, it's, it's not already, but uh, I mean, even to see, I, I renewed my wife's car insurance uh, just recently, and, and just with, uh, with, with Aviva, and I think one of the, things was the first thousand miles was covered from for the carbon offsetting. It was part of that process. It was that easy. So uh, I, I think that's hopefully where this will become as more of a nature credit, not just carbon. It, it's an all-encompassing. B&G will be forming part of that, but it's a, it's a lot more to it. Yeah, I can wave 
Oh, please, if you'd like to add, I was going to... Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think there is there is obviously some funds that are being built for nat natural capital, and, and I, yeah, I don't know the entry size ticket for the things like that, but um, I think from a, from a smaller individual investment, I think there's still probably some, some way to go to, to create a really liquid market with a tradable platform that... That is that is valid. I think you know even within the the voluntary carbon markets today. If you say I want to buy uh, you know two hundred thousand pounds worth of credits, you know there's still this double counting retirement. Uh, you know, I, I, so I think there's there's a, there's a hopefully a future there to create a liquid market, um, but it needs more guardrails, more safety, um, and I think that potentially don't want to scare people, but might could come from blockchain and things like that that could sit hopefully behind uh, the scene. Um, but but just to provide more more regulation, more safety to, to, to people who might hold an asset, um, to understand what's behind it, you know, when, when, when was it activated, you know, all of that stuff that could be hidden in the detail behind an asset rather than the, where we are today. Um. So it's building. I think we've not quite answered that. We're still too nascent, perhaps, to have made it all the way to, to standard IFA advice. But um, if I can swi switch across um, to the next question, thank you for that. Uh, it was actually a response to the previous question. Um, so as we, as we are building our investment fund, we see um, typically local government pension schemes as being the first wave but we do see a considerable growth in the private wealth sector coming in sort of three, five, ten years' time. But that's probably going to be aggregated through um, the wealth managers who provide that kind of service rather than to individuals um, because it won't be feasible for large funds to work with sort of sums even in the sort of the, 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 the millions, it's, it needs to be in the tens of millions, uh, which you can get through through that level of aggregation. And, um, you know, very much picking up on what Lorenzo is saying, um, you know, there will, there will be blockchain to, not as this nasty, horrible uh, <laughs> NFT um, Bitcoin thing, but as a very efficient, dependable, traceable way of guaranteeing transactions took place. So it's coming. I can't say exactly when. <laughs> uh, thanks for that comment. Didn't anticipate finding a way to Bitcoin and blockchain uh, today. And maybe that's, I'm remiss uh, for that. Perhaps I should have been on the front foot. There were a couple of other questions in, can I, yeah, if one could turn to that. Um, is that a question? Uh, Please um, jump in. Looking at um, BNG and uh, Landowners still don't know what the tax implications are and what will happen after 30 years. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any way of pressuring whichever government comes in to um, try and get some clarity. Thank you. Um, Colin, looks like you're straight out of the blocks. Uh, always a difficult uh, subject to breach as tax, but there are some, some uh, accountants here I know in the audience. Uh, we were involved in uh, presenting some information in the white paper to Treasury about how we felt uh, these um, natural capital trades should be dealt with, because if they're taxed off the face of the earth and no one's going to invest in, uh, in them, there was a small piece uh, in the budget, it was sort of buried in the in the detail, but uh, it, at the moment it looks like it will receive agricultural um, relief, agricultural property relief. Uh, we've also had an indication from Treasury very recently uh, that they would look at the first 50% of any deal as capital and then the next 50% of a deal as income. Now, that's not come to the statute books, and I'm guessing it won't happen now until we see a new government. Um, but there was quite a lot of um, requests for information from the Treasury to try and get this right. And uh, again, Green Finance Institute, I know, sit between DEFRA and Treasury, and I know that they were very instrumental in trying to make this um, as easy as possible for landowners, because if it becomes a real tax burden, then people aren't just going to get get involved really thanks ever so much there's a was it on the same topic yeah please we'll get your microphone 
Thank you very much. Uh, John Hall, I'm a, a, a business consultant specialising in agricultural, horticultural businesses, especially in high-tech glass houses for, for uh, very large amounts of food production. And I wanted to bring the discussion back to food production, if I may, um, because there is a, a problem. Uh, I, I'm a great environmentalist. I believe in everything we've been talking about today. But the UK only produces 60% of its food. It only produces 75% of its indigenous food, that is, basic foods like cereals and, and root crops, etc. So every time we take an acre out, what, even if it's marginal land, every time we take an acre out... It seems to have dropped off ever so slightly. Hello? Yes, no, better. No, okay, okay. Uh, every time we take an acre out of... Uh, production for biodiversity net gain or other similar areas, which I totally support. However, it has an impact on food production, which is already too low. How does the panel suggest that we try to deal with these opposing issues? Thank you ever so much. Uh, well you've got the microphone. Do you want to kick us off, Mark, Colin? Then we can pass it along. So, so. Uh, thank you. I, and it, I think it's a really relevant question because you know food security is is, is vital. Um, I think what we, in our membership, I, I don't know one of our 438 members that wants to do anything other than produce food, produce it profitably, produce it in a very environmental way. Uh, there's lots of uh, data now, and we work very closely with the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust and with Rothamsted uh, Research uh, Institution, and I think it's very much proven that the sustainability of agricultural production will only continue if we farm it in an environmental way. I think that's absolutely um, clear now. And you know, I think if we continue to farm as we had been, you know, there's lots of uh, people that say we had probably 30 harvests left here in the Northern Hemisphere. So I think this balance, and it really is a balance, of food production, that's absolutely our primary goal as a farming industry, but we have to understand the benefit of doing it in tandem with nature. And that's the message that we try and get across to our membership all the time. And, and we're pushing at open doors, really. That, that's, that's what they want to do. I don't know any of our members that want to completely stop food production. It's vital. Debbie, you got something to add? Yes. Um, I think we need to bust a few myths, because I don't think nature restoration is the biggest threat to food security at all. Um, climate change, soil loss... You know, degradation of the environment is a far bigger risk to food security overall than a bit of nature restoration and a bit of rewilding. And frankly, we've got to look at how we use our agricultural land. Um, you know, the Isle of Wight is part of my patch, and about 20% of Isle of Wight land is now growing energy crops. We're also seeing, you know, pretty much grade one agricultural land growing turf for the you know, gardening industry. Um, you know, we've got land used for you know, golf courses and huge amounts going under housing, right? So, and 30% of food produced is wasted. So, frankly, we've got to use our land much better. And if you read the fantastic National Food Strategy, you know, produced by Henry Dimbleby, you know, he's very clear that actually we can afford to probably um, put about 20% of farmland into some form of nature restoration and recovery with no impact at all on food security if we just use the land we've got better and grow slightly different things you know less uh, fodder crops and, and feed for animals more um, human food if I can put it that way and then we've got to think about climate change we need to be growing more you know horticultural crops more nuts more legumes different kinds of things and use less of our land for energy crops and and livestock feed and start to really have a serious conversation about food security because we need both. We've got to have nature and food. We've got to create the jobs and we probably need to create new markets so that those local food chains and those supply chains work better. And a lot of landowners I know, you know, they're growing kind of commodity crops and energy crops and other things because they can't make a living any other way. There's not enough abattoirs. You know, there's so many issues that stop this working. So. You know, I would love the government to pick up the national food strategy and implement everything in it because there's so many answers in that document.
Fabulous. Um, thanks, Debbie, and thanks, thanks for the question. Um, Prompted another question at the back, if I can turn to you. Hi there. Um, following on a bit from what's just been said, because you summed it up nicely, but just turn a bit on, sorry, Will Atkinson, farmer in the South Downs. Um, we've talked a lot about landscape and what Ben's doing, big scale. There's a lot of estates here, big scale. But then we're talking about uh, when this becomes mainstream. Well, I was a early into the nitrate neutrality. I went to put 20 acres in when it all first came out with the Wildlife Trust. Took, it, took the crop out for a whole year as the legislation came to, and then they bought their farm on the Isle of Wight. Stung fingers a little bit. Bit sore, because that was probably 200 grand for us in the bank as a farm. Now, we run, that, that's fine, understand why it all happened in the end, and it's great. But what I don't want to see in the next few years as this develops into BNG and becomes more mainstream, what we've got here is a group of people that probably are a little bit more in depth, in depth into how it all works. When it gets to mainstream farmers, we've got to be really careful that we don't alienate them. And I just worry a little bit where we talk about landscape. So let's buy a farm for 600 acres and do that. Well, if the uh, Wildlife Trust could go, here's 20 farms and they've all got 50 acres on, they could have advisors on the farms, ecologists, all educated farmers, and that will join the gaps between farmers and ecologists where there's always been those gaps, there's always been butting heads and no one understands each other. And I'd love to see in my generation farmers to be able to talk to an ecologist and understand what they're talking about. So I don't know if, if that's now what the Wildlife Trust would like to see, or maybe that's Habitat Vault, maybe that's your way of doing it. Maybe you should just go direct to an investor who wants small t small amount of credits for a small farm that wants to do something. I don't know your thoughts. Yeah, no, um, thanks for that. Yeah, yeah I mean, 100% agree. It's definitely not our uh, ambition to go and buy loads of land. We want to buy a bit, and mainly to join up tiny little reserves we've got and join the gaps and do that bit Matthew talked about earlier, the, the hectares to join up stuff we have already. But absolutely, you know, working in partnership, you know, there's a great partnership here to be had, and we've, we've got a few examples where we're working really, really effectively with farmers, so they're grazing our land, we're doing the monitoring for them, we're jointly marketing the produce, we're linking up supply chains, and we're doing loads of really cool stuff, so absolutely, 100% agree, we've got to do this together, and the worst thing we can do is be in competition with each other, because that's just not going to help anybody, and we'll just fuel a race to the bottom, which is not what we want, so... Yeah, absolutely. Let's really look at the combined skills that we have. You know, we employ loads of ecologists. We have great, you know, got huge memberships so we can reach people from a kind of marketing and communications point of view. You know, we mail out to hundreds of thousands of people. Great opportunity to get messages out there about good farming, regenerative practice and nature recovery, food and jobs. You know, we want more nature and more jobs, better food, healthier soils tick all of those boxes and work together and what a great story so yeah definitely want to work more in partnership thank you yeah it's uh, it's certainly how we're sort of approaching things the the landowners and and typically farmers that we're we're speaking to at the moment it's it's very much so about incorporating it within current activity on the farm so essentially it's it's rarely going to be 100 percent. it will be a small area it's usually areas where you know, they've, they've been farming and the crop's not really doing what they want it to do. It's not that, that great and it's trying to make use, better use of other parcels of land on, on their site. So it's very much so a, a, that's how we, we, we look. And also when we're devising our um, plan, it very much is a, a, a collaborative approach with how the farmer wants to use the land for the future, for the next 30 years, a long, long time, uh, and in terms of how they, they use the land currently as well. So you know, it's not a case of, of people sticking to the metric and, and saying, right, I just want to upscale as many units as possible to, to maximise the, the value of my land. It's very much what what's going to work in tan, tan, tandem with current activities um, and, and, yeah, sort of integrating that into your current activities, really. And Colin, dive in, yeah. Yeah, just to finish off really with that, um, we're baselining uh, all of our members' farms as quickly as we can. Uh, we're doing it with ecologists on the ground, foot truthing it, seeing what uh, the possibilities are on that farm to get additionality. Also in that uh, report, there will be um, some information that might uh, try to identify the land that is least um, uh, 
productive and that might be the piece of land that we've got to have. There's a lot of technology out there now. There's a lot of skills that make sure that, you know, if we are going to take land out of production, we can, we can pick the right place. But I think it's really key, you talked about small farmers, it's really key that they are uh, involved in all of this. It's not, not just big landowners. It's got, it's got to go across the whole of the industry. I think, you know, one of our aims is to try and keep farming going and it's such an important part of community and society particularly in you know remote rural areas it's it's it's, in, it's imperative that we keep these farms up and running so you know as bps disappears and we can find other forms of income that's got to be really really positive but um, i think um, there's, there's 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 real you know possibilities in all of this and if i take the opportunity so i'm lucky enough to be part of a couple of national parks or have seen and seen some of the work here and i think what you speak to is uh, is highly relevant, not just because we do need some of those pioneers who've taken a landscape and had the ability to sort of weather through purchasing or hist you know inheritance. They're, they're able to drive something to illustrate the art of the possible. Because in the, mo in the at the moment, I think the absence there's an absence of data about what works, what drives a return. If you put that in financial language, that is riskier. So all of this work that's taking place is de-risking <laughs> that environment. But scale doesn't take that model and say, right, we buy the, ne the next half of the county. Um, scale needs to think about how you engage and activate and empower those other landowners right across it. And I know that um, I can speak from the park's point of view. I know all of the parks are thinking really carefully about that. And the cultural point, which was picked up, the, this is what there are many cultural aspects to what takes place on the land around here. That's true of the other parks, the, the Lake District, the Upland Farms, all of those things and how they work. It isn't success if we lose all of that. It is success if we figure out how to make these things uh, work together and understand where those margins. So thanks to all for bringing that and for the question. Um, we've probably got enough time for one other question from the audience. If, if there isn't, there you are. <laughs> um, it's, it's really about urban environments. We're talking about you know landscape uh, improvements. What about urban environments? Um, or is it too difficult just because of land prices, housing pressures. This is where we need to see some improvements in nature for well-being and amenity use as well. Do you think that is a difficult area to actually sell credits and get developers to concentrate on having BNG there, or, is, or do you think it will be offsetting elsewhere? Well, and I think by extension, uh, if we can't make it work in the urban environment, do we just doom ourselves to there's the, there's, there's the urban and there's the, the wildlife? So how do, how do we bring those together as well? I, I, Debbie, do you want to um, kick us well off? Well, I've got a couple of thoughts. I mean, you know, I'm not necessarily an expert on this, but it is also, it's, it's true to say that, you know, many settlements in the UK, people do not have access to green space. We know that the poorest in society have the least access to the environment and, you know, Having a healthy environment is very well connected to mental health outcomes. Having a, a healthy environment in urban spaces is connected to things like crime rates. You know, you have less crime or you have more green space, uh, better communities. Um, so there's loads and loads of really important reasons why we need more green space in urban areas. So, you know, we, there's a I don't know whether there's a, something in the green infrastructure strategy about trying to make sure that everybody has access to green space within you know 15 minutes of where they live, etc. Um, so it's an important thing to do. Whether or not BNG is the right mechanism, I don't know. And I think Professor David Hill said at the beginning, um, you know, BNG is supposed to be about biodiversity recovery, and it's not that easy to deliver it in, in some places in urban areas. But sometimes it is. I think it depends. And if you're connecting up, um, you know, green corridors, and then you connect through into perhaps into a wider landscape, then that's all to the good. So I think it's about being creative, working strategically with the local authority and the delivery partners to see whether those can that can mechanism can deliver something really beneficial. Um, you know, we've got examples of other schemes in the southeast, things like Sangs and other stuff. Sometimes what they deliver is a bit rubbish. Sometimes it's really good. So I think it's about the quality of the advice, working with the ecologists and the strategic partners to make sure it is delivering the benefits. Um, you know, BNG on-site delivery is a, is a thing, and that's normally the first thing people are supposed to look at. If it's done well, it could deliver real great benefits, but it could also be done badly. So I think it depends on the advice. 
Yeah, I, I think I'd just add, I think there was a recent statistics on, on the review of on-site uh, biodiversity that was done, and the numbers were, were appalling, sadly. Um, so, uh, you know, I think what we what came out of today is, is this joined up larger scale approach is going to actually have more of an impact. We obviously need the green spaces in, in, our, in our cities, and, and the value is, 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 is obviously there in numbers, and even unquantified. I think we're still trying to get to grips of, of really the, the healthcare benefits, mental health benefits. Um, I, so I, I think I would caution, you know, to make sure, I think maybe more needs to be done on site, um, more verification, more, more sort of um, onus on, 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 on the delivery partner to have that 30-year delivery and, and make sure that's happening. I think when you, you know, I've been speaking to Grosvenor, and they, they have obviously huge legacies. If you want to look into what good looks like from a net zero point of view, look at their, look at what they're doing and how they've brought in um, their, their their supply chain into into ups, upskilling them and, and helping them towards net zero. They have a biodiversity goal, but even even within such a, a, a large swathe of land that they have, they're having a difficult time. How do they deliver it? How are they transparent about it? So it's not it's not easy, but I think it has to be joined up with with local government but you know I, th I i you know i see a lot of the value in these larger landscape you know like we've discussed this connectivity the, these elements of really doing it where it can be done best i think that's that's going to have a, a huge impact so. great you, you've got me on an, an interesting subject here um well done simon so i, I just have two thoughts on this don't need to worry about timings Great, I guess fine. No, no, it's fine. Um, well, the first one is I have a hunch that, you know, in, in our closest urban areas, you know, look at Greater London. I think the the house, the, the value of the land is going to be so great that I think the question will be completely taken out of the com the conversation, if you like, and and it wouldn't surprise me if that was the case for Portsmouth, Southampton, Brighton, and so on in our direct locality. The second point I think is really important is the distinction between green space, amenity space, good green infrastructure, good planning, um, and BNG, because they're very different, entirely different things. And I think the danger is, if we say that green space is, is a new habitat and it l works well on the metric, well, inevitably, little Johnny's gonna play football on that in about six months' time. And then someone one day will put a path through it. And then, of course, we get into the debate that we've had today. You know, it's a tokenistic greenwashing attempt. And cumulatively, that could be da really dangerous ac across the nation. So I think if it is on site, as you suggest, si it's Simon, isn't it? If it is on site, you know, it's got to be meaningful, it's got to be significant, and it's got to be regulated, it's got to be absolutely tied down, bomb-proof. Uh, and if it is, brilliant, absolutely brilliant, as Debbie says. But if it isn't, let's just, let's just let, allow good planning to play out and allow this lovely green space and green and blue infrastructure to make our development fantastic in the future. And we talked about urban green and blue, but there's a, there are brownfield sites in there as well. And I, I think there must be, I know certainly there's a project in Scotland about bringing all of that list together across the whole area and actually trying to really ruthlessly look at how can it be meaningfully used and brought back into productive use. Now, whether that's as a, a building, as a sort of amenity, or actually whether it's as nature. So I think there's another dimension. All of this, though, speaks to the fact that we are early in our journey. And I'm really sorry, everybody, but my, I was given a very firm brief about timings and I'm conscious that we need to navigate. So I'm just, if I could say a huge thanks. And James didn't leave because he got bored, I hasten to add. He had a meeting with the London Mayor, in fact, so had to disappear. Um, um, so apologies from James, but if I could just say thanks to James, Colin, Debbie, Lorenzo, Mike and Mark for all your facts. <laughs> So, we're in the, the final, final meters of our, our summit today, and um, we're just going to head into the next session. Are you... Sorry, that's all right. I, uh, forgive me. I, uh, I, I found myself being rude. I'm so sorry, chatting away. That's what today is about. Um, so, um, I, I think it's... A, well, it speaks to many ways. I've said this before. I, I'm delighted you've been talking as much as you have, because that's what our ambition was, is to to kick a conversation off. Now, it's not this first conversation that's, you know, um, are we at the end of um, the beginning? I don't know. Are we about to get into the next phase? Not, we're not quite sure where we are in that continuum. But we, we knew, know we needed to 
get into another gear. We needed to take what we'd already learned and start to share it further, start to pose some of those next, next questions that come with this and offer up a place to start. You know, it's a nascent, nascent market. Now, as much as I say that, I'm conscious somebody's, there's been 18 years worth of development that's been mentioned. There's been, there's decades, in fact. And of course, we stand on the fact that there are some amongst us, some landowners who've been pursuing this for as long as their family's been on that piece of land, because that's the innate values they've brought to bear. Where we find ourselves now is how we are start to assemble all these different things. How do we start to align them in a way that can take us on to address those humanity's existential threats? Climate we can't escape, nature. And, the, and people talk about them as dual, but often climate just somehow gets that bit more airtime. Nature needs to get just as much airtime, at least as much, arguably more, depending on your community you come from. But we, need, we can start to influence and, s and nudge that along. We can certainly innovate. The pioneers amongst us can encourage this group here, this community of practice. You are now further on that journey. It was mentioned about how complex all of this is. You are further on that journey. Now, I, I have wondered if we need a glossary, actually, and there are questions I'll ask later about how many of you actually knew about what an S106 was or whatever it was, and a, a bundle or a, a stack or all of this. You have taken steps. Many of you are well into your own journeys, but as a community, we're taking even more. And this really brings me back to why here, why now, and why is a national park? And um, I won't, I hope, steal too many words from Vanessa's close in a moment, but the spot, the national parks sit in a particular part of our um, public life, I guess. Our, um, and they can often be perceived as being one thing. And, and of course, for whatever reason, the US national parks perhaps are more, more prominent in some people's thinking about this sort of big piece of nature or what they do, or perhaps your only experience is a planning authority because they said no to a window change or something. The, the power of national parks is what I hope you start to see today, which is cutting across multiple agendas, skills agendas, urban issues with, and health, uh, climate, but also nature, how all of these actually are incredibly linked and how figuring out one part of the system can unlock an opportunity in a different part. And so if I could encourage anything from, uh, is to take more time to engage with part of the park, draw on their resources, their knowledge, draw on the, t the people they can connect you to that reduce the amount of paperwork you might have to do or at least make the time when you go through it that little bit easier because it's a, a tremendous asset and a tremendous resource and that is what national parks in the 21st century are about, about cross-cutting, about driving that change that works towards a landscape that works and delivers for all. And forgive me, I can't quite remember the exact phraseology for <laughs> South Downs, but that's the sentiment. It's, it's got to be a working living landscape that is delivering on all of those outcomes. So that's my final thoughts. It touches on systems thinking, it touches on partnership. It leads me to a challenge to you all that is in light of having invested a day out of the sunlight in this room, listening and engaging, please reflect, think, and most importantly, act. Whatever it is, just whether it's one email, one connection, one phone call, something to take you forward. I'll stop my thoughts there, but I would just like to say a few thank yous before I turn over to Vanessa to, to bring the summit to a close. So these things don't happen by accident. We said thanks for the, the food, but I would just, the many people with green t-shirts all around, Ruth, many, and uh, forgive me, I don't know all of the names of everybody else, but if, if I could just ask a quick thank you for all of those who actually helped pull to it together today. Um, I'm going to pause, leave it there. Um, a big thank you from me to you for helping make today work as well as I, I think it has, and we'll find out in the feedback forms later, I'm sure. Um, but if uh, the final thing that I get to do is to invite the chair of the National Park Authority, Vanessa Rowlands, to the stage to share some closing thoughts and remarks. Thank you. I think we need to thank you, James. Because you've done amazing today. I just, that is an incredibly hard job to facilitate an event like this, to be listening to what everyone's saying in a panel and looking for questions. That's really, really hard. And thank you so much for doing such an amazing job for us. Thank you.
Yeah. Thank you all so much for joining us today for such an inspiring and invigorating conference on green finance and nature-based solutions. Listening to you all, I'm convinced that every person in this room has a vital role to play in this transformation. I'm just thinking of the connections that I've made just around the tea table and talking to people. And if we can all just follow up, you know, a couple of those connections that we made today, that is really starting that process. So please think about that. Protected landscapes, NGOs, landowners, and other partners are leading the way with innovative nature recovery schemes. Landowners are stepping up with ambitious restoration projects, and the private sector is driving sustainable investments that not only aim for net zero, but also help to restore the natural landscape. Of course, we've talked about the risks and challenges ahead. When pushing boundaries and exploring new solutions, there's always a chance of setbacks. But actually, I really feel with the news that we heard yesterday that perhaps there might be some change coming down the track. And I, I, someone mentioned to me earlier today that there's a, actually a march for nature um, in London on June the 22nd, which couldn't be more well-timed and I know what I'm doing that day. <laughs> so I think that's really, we have got to push for that. We need to hear our politicians mentioning nature in this campaign, vital. So whatever way, if you have any ins with anybody, if you meet your MP campaigning or prospective parliamentary candidate, ask them what they're gonna be doing about nature. Um, that's why it's so crucial as well to think about our approach to green finance with integrity and a commitment to doing what's right for people and nature. So today, South Downs National Park Authority have made an important step forward by adopting the Green Finance Pledge, which has three key components. Meeting environmental targets. We pledge to support the UK government's environmental targets through green financing, facilitating private investment in sustainable projects. Adopting nature market principles. We commit to applying these principles to all green financing initiatives within our sphere of influence and ensuring transparency and accountability. Empowering landowners. We pledge to foster nature-based solutions that benefit both people and nature, strengthening the social fabric of our communities and encouraging local stewardship. These principles are our roadmap to a greener and more vibrant future. And I encourage each of you to reflect on how you can contribute, whether you're just beginning your journey or already deeply involved in this work. Together we can build a South Downs and a wider landscape that's more beautiful, resilient and thriving with life. Thank you so much for coming today and let's keep this going. Thank you.